Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the book of Ephesians. So we have 14 lessons this quarter on six chapters. So you might guess we're going to dive in fairly deep. And that's one of the things we'll be doing in the next, uh, well, continue to do over the next few weeks. This particular lesson, number 11, for September 9 of 2023, is entitled Practicing Supreme Loyalty to Christ. Practicing Supreme Loyalty to Christ. Hmm. As usual, we'd like to begin with prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying you, of, ha of having the evidence spread out on the pages of Scripture and other inspirational uh, sources. Help us to know how we can serve you better because we know as we look around us in the world that things are coming to a conclusion very rapidly. Help us to be prepared is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If the Bible is abridged or shortened, is it still the Bible? What part could be left out and it still be the Bible? It's still a book. Yeah. <laughs> Does the message of the Bible change if some of the stories are left out? What about if some of the killings are left out? Well, or the genealogies for that matter. We, most of us think we don't really need those. Jim? From the Bible Study Guide, in 2018, an artifact like the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. attached, excuse me, attracted much attention. It was an abridged Bible designed to teach essentials of faith while deleting any passage inciting rebellion by slaves. Published in 1808, the text does not just remove a passage here and there. 90% of the Old Testament is missing, and 50% of the new of the 1,189 chapters in the Bible are only, of, of that only 30, 232 remain. Passages seem to reinforce the evils suspect the Bible study guide instead of evils meant to say reinforce the benefits of good aspects of slavery, especially in the absence of so much of the Bible's narrative, narrative of good news, are left fully intact, including such oft misused texts as servants. Be obedient to them that they that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart, as unto Christ. Ephesians 6, 5, from the Bible Study Guide for September 2. So since we're studying Ephesians 6, well, what do we do with these slavery passages? Well, it has been estimated that many of those who were slaves were indentured. This is talking about Paul's day, so a little different situation than our day were indentured because they could not pay their debts. So now I'm going to ask a very touchy question. How many of us would be slaves if those same rules applied today? <laughs> well, Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is a slave of the lender. Yeah. And so if that's the case, most everybody has some level of slavery. If, if, if they use credit cards or well, mortgages it, or whatever. It is estimated that 60% of the people living around the Mediterranean Sea at the time of Jesus were, quote, slaves, end quote. How many people in the United States today are in debt? We are not trying to answer that question, but you can just see. It's more than 60%, I suspect. Almost certainly. Obviously, Paul lived in a very different cultural setting than what we are in and used to in uh, the developed world today. There are a few places in the world where slavery is still openly practiced. Saudi Arabia is one of those. In Paul's day, many people had to sell themselves into slavery on a temporary basis to pay their debts. So notice these words that Paul wrote and his advice for parents, children, masters, and slaves. Gary? Uh, Ephesians 6, 1 through 9. One, children, it is your Christian duty to obey your parents, for this is the right thing to do. Number two, respect your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise added. Three, so that all may go well with you and you may live a long time in the land. 
Number four, parents, do not treat your children in such a way as to make them angry. Instead, bring them up with Christian discipline and instruction. Five, slaves, obey your human masters with fear and trembling, and do it with a sincere heart, as though you were serving Christ. Six, do this not only when they are watching you because you want to gain their approval, but with all your heart do what God wants as slaves of Christ. Seven, do your work as slaves cheerfully as though you serve the Lord and not merely human beings. Eight, remember that the Lord will reward everyone, whether slave or free, for the good work they do. Number nine, masters, behave in the same way toward your slaves and stop using threats. Remember that you and your slaves belong to the same master in heaven who judges every by, everyone by the same standard. American Bible Society, 1992. Uh, the Holy Bible, Good News Translation. If you go back up to verse one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Children, it is your duty to listen to your parents. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say obey. Well, Unfortunately, we translated it in English, yeah. obey. Yeah, the, the, uh, the Greek does something that we, 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 we lump it together. We assume that when you listen, then you're going to do it. And it's two separate steps, very different steps. So obey doesn't necessarily mean that you mean people. There are cases where people listen and really want to obey, but they can't for some reason. Try to imagine what it would be like for a master and a slave in Paul's day to worship in the same Christian home church. These are not big, huge, fancy edifices. These are home churches. And you go to church and there you sit down next to your slave. How would that impact? It could happen. It could happen. It did happen. I mean, we'll talk about the story of Philemon. Okay, children have had a very different and often difficult status at various times in this world's history. What should be the right relationship between parents and their children? Gordon? Ephesians 6, 1 through 3. Children, it is your Christian duty to obey your parents. As Jim was just saying, maybe it should be listen and consider. Mm -hmm. For this is the right thing to do. Respect your father and mother is the first commandment that has a promise added so that all may go well with you and you may live a long time on the land. Okay, you want to go ahead with the next one there? Matthew 18, 1 through 5 and verse 10. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus asking, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? So Jesus called a child, made him stand in front of them and said, I assure you that unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt for a second because sitting next to you is a pediatrician. <laughs> What's the most important characteristic of a child? Their honesty and transparency. Okay, that's a good part of it, but that's not the most important, I don't think. Mm, their ability to learn. Okay, that's a bigger piece. Keep going, you're, you're, on, a good, <laughs> you're on a good trend. Mm, growth. Their curiosity. Their, their capacity for growth in every field mentally, physically, socially, spiritually, their capacity to grow. grow. I mean, what, 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 do you, what happens if a parent comes in to you and says, my child doesn't seem to be growing? That's a panic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very severe. So the most important characteristic of a child is this capacity to grow, not, and not just physically, but in all the right ways. I mean, if a child develops intellectual stagnation. I mean, that's a real big problem, isn't it? If what there's intellectual it? stagnation, they come to me. <laughs> yeah, and you, you can't do anything about My it. My associates. Oh, there okay. are a few things that can be done. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, Number verse, four? verse four, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is the one who humbles himself and becomes like this child. And whoever welcomes in my name one such child as this welcomes me. Jumping to verse 10, 
see that you don't despise any of these little ones. Their angels in heaven, I tell you, are always in the presence of my Father in heaven. Wow. Good News Bible. Okay, Jennifer, maybe you could pick it up there. Sure, from Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. Some people brought children to Jesus for him to place in hands on them, his hands on them, but the disciples scolded the people. When Jesus noticed this, he was angry and said to his disciples, let the children come to me and do not stop them because the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. I assure you that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Then he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on each of them and blessed them. Wow. Can you imagine Ellen White expands this verse and she says, one, one lady started off with her children headed over to find Jesus. She says, I want Jesus to bless my child. Oh, that's a good idea. I mean, pretty soon there was a whole crowd of them all bringing their kids saying, we need the blessing of Jesus. Wow, wow. What a, yeah, for sure. Ellen White expands with these words, which I, I love. The poorest and humblest were not afraid to approach him, that is to Jesus. Even little children were attracted to him. They loved to climb up upon his lap and to kiss that pensive face benignant with love. Imagine that. Probably while he's speaking to great crowds, there he, there he is, the little children are climbing on his lap. That's Testimonies of Ministers, Volume 3, page 422. Testimonies to ministers or testimonies for the church? I'm sorry, testimonies for the church. Yep. Thank you. These were words of wisdom from Paul, writing from prison where he could be ex executed any day just for being a Christian and promoting, Christian, pro promoting Christianity. He wrote to the Ephesians, Colossians, etc., who were widespread in their small Christ Christian home churches in Western Turkey, which was then known as Asia Minor. I've had the privilege of visiting each one of those places and noticed Ephesians was a huge place, but uh, I mean, Ephesus was a huge place, but Colossae was a pretty small place. Paul wrote in regard to how parents should relate to children and children to parents and how masters should relate to the slaves and slaves to masters. As you can imagine, these ideas were quite revolutionary. For whatever reason, Paul thought it was necessary at that point in his life to take on several of the major social problems of his culture. Now, think about this. He's in prison. He's at, there basically at the whim of Nero, who thinks that he's the god on earth and thinks he has the control over everything. And Paul is telling him how he should raise his kids and how they should all behave and how they should relate to their slaves, etc. Wow. Um, wives versus husbands, it talks about major problems, wives versus husbands, children versus parents, masters versus slaves, etc. Why do you think Paul chose to do that? It is very significant to notice that in each case where there seemed to be a mistreatment, Paul encouraged both the perpetrators and the sufferers to realize that God is their true master and that there are times when it is necessary to disobey whoever it is that claims to be the master. Thus, Paul's command to obey was not absolute. Okay, so what do we have to, to take us beyond that? Ellen White said, when the commands of unbelieving parents contradict the requirements of Christ, then pay, painful though it may be, they, that is children, must obey God and trust the consequences with him. Ellen White, Review and Herald, November 15, 1892. It would take a discerning child to know yeah. when to obey their parents and when to obey God. I yeah. think we call that at least a youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, not necessarily. I grew up in a household where my father could be a real danger. And I had to face him twice when I was in my early teens. And I had a weapon as well, because he was about to kill my mother. And you yeah. don't see anything like that in there, but trust me, it's not good. And you feel the presence of devils when that's going on. Mm -hmm. The whole, what's the word? The air yeah, The changes. environment, yeah. It's cold. Mm -hmm. And you know you're dealing with some bad stuff. Yeah.
Paul significantly increased the impact of his statements about parents and children by quoting directly from the Old Testament. What an amazing thing. The fifth commandment obviously encourages children to obey their parents because such action has with it a great reward. Do you think the fact that Paul was in prison for what he was teaching made his messages more forceful or less so? If your pastor was writing you and giving you his best possible advice, he's writing from prison. Depends upon why he's there. Yeah. yeah. Is he there for embezzling? Well, or yeah. Or is he there for, sure, that for was, church work? <laughs> yeah. As, assuming you're, he's there for the right reasons. Yeah. yeah. Along with his advice to parents and children, masters and slaves, husbands and wives, Paul gives other directions. He included advice to avoid all kinds of evil practices, such as lying, greed, living like a heathen, that's an interesting statement, etc. He decried sexual immorality, indecency, and greed of any kind. You think he was thinking about the temple in Ephesus? <laughs> If we, are Christians were, if we as Christians were to follow Paul's advice in Ephesians 4 through 6, how different would our churches be? Would, peop would people be attracted? I think part of it too is that when he talks about parents and children um, and husbands and wives, it's always thinking as, as God as the husband, the church as the wife, and for parents, as God, as that parent. Mm -hmm. And we have to get our parenting from how God was rather than what all the books say and <laughs> what we hear about. The, right. Yes. If the treatment of children was a particular problem in Paul's day, a father felt that legally, uh, we lost a part of a sentence there, I'm sorry. A father felt that legally he had absolute control over all of his children, even the point of putting his own children to death if they disobeyed. That, that was legally permissible in Paul's day. However, notice these interesting contrasts from Paul. Jim? Her, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, Six verse 4. Nine. Parents do not treat your children in such a way that, as to make them angry. Instead, bring them up with Christian discipline and instruction from the Good News Bible. And then Colossians 3, 21, parents do not irritate your children or they will become discouraged. Then the Bible study guide follows with Sirach, a Jewish document available in Paul's day, advised, advises fathers about the treatment of their sons. He who loves his son will whip him often, pamper a child and he will terrorize you Play with him and he will grieve you. Discipline him, excuse me, discipline your son and make his yoke heavy so that you may not be offended by his shamelessness. That's from Sarah. Okay, Jennifer, is that what you teach your parents? <laughs> My <laughs> sakes, what a miserable. I know, those are the opposite of how is. God is with us, right? Oh, boy. <laughs> wow. But this, this, was, this was considered scripture yeah, to a lot of people yeah. in those days. In, this, is, this is one of the books of the Apocrypha. Yeah. Uh, hold on. Sirach, yeah. Old yeah. Testament Apocrypha. The wisdom of uh, somebody. Here, it was, is it? Yeah. yeah. In dealing with children, Paul used his usual tactic, providing two opposite, opposing ideas in contrast. Do not provoke your children anger, followed by a positive one. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I sure brought, glad you brought that that Syriac passage up. That that is, and that infected the yeah. the, the Catholic Bible is filled, has that in there. Mm -hmm. But who teaches uh, Jeremiah six verse seven? Yeah. Well, even all these verses we're looking at right here. I the mean, pastors and the and the priests, excuse me, the priests and the prophets are motivated by greed. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah six verse seven. Yeah. That's not it's, a fluke. Paul was, I mean, Jeremiah was talking about a lot of very false people who claimed to be priests and prophets. Carrie, you want to take on the Bible study guide there? Yes. In Paul's day, fathers had complete legal power over their children who were regarded as his property. Now, let me, let me interrupt for a second. I don't know how many of you understand how 
that is. And still many parts of the world. We, my wife and I, did some traveling around countries in Africa and to talk about families and what they are and so forth like this. And it was absolutely believed by the tribes, by most of the tribes there, that the children are only from the father. The mother is just a garden. The father plants his seed in the garden and the child comes out and the child belongs to the father. Mother has no rights over this child whatsoever. And when you show them how it really works and you teach them that half of the DNA comes from the mother and half from the father, I mean, we just, we had women groups just weeping and, I mean, these are our children. I mean, this is, we're talking in our day. We're not talking about in Paul's day. Were some of those tribes Christian tribes, or they? Oh yeah, these are Christians. What about oh. the, the the group that it was Muslims with the what they do with the women and, and their and their their daughters that oh, yeah. and, and, and uh, they kill them if they yeah. shame the, the the family name yeah. or what they call they call shame the family or yeah. whatever. Yeah. Okay, Carrie, go ahead. Uh, well, where did we get up to? We saw uh, indeed father's it's a, head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, father's head. Second line. Okay. Father had right to inflict violent punishment, even death, on their children. That might have been so then. I wasn't going to do that, but I, but I told you a while ago. Indeed, some respects the father's power over his children exceeded a master's authority over his slaves. Paul is not endorsing such power, but is boldly clarifying and reshaping family relationships. In the context of a supreme loyalty to Christ, Paul invites Christian fathers to rethink their use of power since children who are provoked to anger will not be well positioned to, quote, the discipline and instruction of the Lord, unquote. Mm. Ephesians 6, 4. Yeah. <clears throat> Gordon, you want to pick that next one up? From Ellen White in Child Guidance. Fathers and mothers, in the home you are to represent God's disposition. You are to require obedience, not with a storm of words, but in a kind, loving manner. And let's, let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, we tend to use the word obedience to refer to, okay, doing what you're told, and with emphasis on the doing. In Greek, the word for obedience is hupakoe. It means listening under. It means willing, you're willing to listen to what the instruction is. And you're, willing, you're, you're trying to understand it. It doesn't necessarily talk about whether you can do it or not, or whether you will do it. It's talking about do you, do you hear it? Do you listen? Do you understand it? And this is, this is very important in our understanding of Christianity because the key to Christianity is not necessarily our performance. We may not be able to perform in many respects. We can't live like, live like Jesus Christ. We're not capable of doing that. But we, we can listen and we can understand and we can intend to do it and we can do our best. And that, that's, in God's mind, that's obedience. Well, and also it's part of learning to reject evil and mm. choose the good. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but to do that, you have to be exposed. In, it's a process of education. It's yeah. not a quick, you know, thus saith so-and-so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Gordon. Continuing in child guidance. Be pleasant in the home. Restrain every word that would arouse unholy temper. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath is a divine injunction. No license is given in God's work for parental severity or oppression or for filial disobedience. The law of God in the home life and in the government of nations flows from a heart of infinite love. Ellen White, Child Guidance, page 259. Wow. Well, in these passages, Paul and Ellen White have dealt with a wide variety of interpersonal relationships. So what does that mean in our day? If God loves all his children, shouldn't we practice being like him? Then Paul turned to the talking about slavery. He told slaves who were slaves when they became Christians not to try to escape from their slavery unless they had an opportunity to do that legally. 
They should obey their masters as far as possible, so long as it was not in contradiction with being slaves of Christ, Jesus Christ. Serving Christ always was to take priority. And there's a number of passages there. Besides Ephesians 6 that we're studying now, there's Colossians 3, the last part of 3 and 4, 1 Corinthians 7, 1 Timothy 6, and 1 Peter 2. So all the church leaders there, they knew, they understood these issues. In each of these passages, Paul called for us to treat all whom we deal with as fellow brothers and, or sisters in Christ. This should be true because we, are, we all have one ultimate master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not all slaves were treated terribly in Paul's day. Jennifer? In the Bible study guide, slavery in the Greco-Roman world could differ from the later version in the New World in significant ways. It was not focused on a single ethnic group. Urban household slaves were sometimes offered opportunities for education and could work as architects, physicians, and philosophers. Freedom sometimes occurred for these household slaves after a limited period of service, though most slaves never gained their freedom. In an attempt to acknowledge such differences, a number of recent Bible versions translate the Greek term dolos, doulos, doulos mm. which is slave, in Ephesians 6, verses 5 through 8, as, quote, bondservant, from the Bible study guide on September 5th. Okay, now what does bondservant mean to you? Not What's much. that different? You owe money to the master. You owe, you have, yeah. you have, you're somehow indebted to him and you're going to work it off over yeah. a period, yeah. period of time. I don't use that word. You don't? No. Not even with your wife? Especially not with my wife. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> Very good. Well, Nevertheless, in fact, in John fifteen fifteen, I no longer call you slaves. He yeah. didn't in this business of calling you servants. That's watered down and ta takes away from the meaning. You're no longer slaves. Slaves to what? Slave to where? To where you came from? The the uh, mindset that you had. Yeah. I'm. He, Jesus came to educate. He came to persuade, and mm -hmm. not order you to do something. Yeah. Nevertheless, slavery is a terrible evil. There is never justification for practicing it. Notice these words from Paul's day. These are the words of an ex-slave. From our Bible study guide, quoting, the cry of ex-slave Publius Cyrus is haunting. Quote, it is beautiful to die instead of being degraded as a slave. Given, end quote. Given the full range of these realities, the translation of doulos as slave is to be preferred. That's what we see in the NIV and the NRSV, especially since these slaves are living under the threat of their masters, from our Bible study guide for Tuesday. Paul did not ask people just to release their earthly slaves. He had a plan to transform society completely. Okay? It's radical. Radical, exactly. And, I mean, you just, you, you listen to the news and... You know, it's, there's this, this news thing that they go by that if it bleeds, it leads. You know, that at, you listen to the news, and I mean, most of a half hour of news is filled up with somebody did a bunch of murders over here and somebody did some murders over there. And so, I mean, I mean, it, what happens? By beholding, we become changed. So the kids are watching that. Even if the parents would think, okay, we're going to just look at the news. The kids are watching that, and what are they thinking? That must be normal behavior. That must be what we're supposed to do when we're Americans. I mean, and so you get people out there standing on the street corner just firing at people randomly. Okay, where are we here? His vision. The Bible study kind. Okay, his vision was not for a manumission released from slavery of slaves in the Roman Empire. Rather, his view was about something other than legal manumission. That is, a new creation, sibling-based fellowship on the basis of adoption as children of God. For Paul, the social revolution was to occur in the church, in the body of Christ, at the local level, and in the Christian house, house church, and household. And this is a comment, of course, on the letter to Philemon. And what's the story behind? We don't have to talk about Philemon now, but what's the story behind Philemon? Do you remember? Philemon, uh, I'm sorry, Onesimus 
was an escaped slave who figured that if he disappeared, if he managed to escape and get to Rome, he could, he could sort of hide in the crowds in Rome. Well, somehow or other, he ran across Paul. And whether Onesimus was in slave, was in, in slavery, or I'm sorry, in prison, and that's how he met Paul, or exactly what, we don't know. But Paul got to know him, and then he said, okay, you were a slave, who was your master? Oh, Philemon, oh yes, I know Philemon, he's a good man. Well, it's time for you to go back. And the, the, the letter that Paul writes to Philemon, his master, he says, you know, here you go, this guy is your slave, I sent him back to you, he came here, he's now a Christian, he's gonna worship with you. Oh, by the way, if he owes you anything, put it to my account. By the way, I'll be there soon, <laughs> I'll just check it on you. <laughs> so, very interesting way of dealing with slavery. And that wasn't a way for Paul to say, I'll pay you. He's saying, you owe your, you, you you owe your, your life, life to me. me. Yes, exactly. So, you know, freeing the slave is the right thing to do. Listen up. <laughs> Unfortunately, some have misquoted and misused Paul's statements as an excuse for perpetrating slavery down through the generations. In Ephesians, Paul said that slaves must, see, must serve their masters not just when they are being watched, but because, but always, I'm sorry, because God is always watching. And so are our guardian angels. Our behavior must be up to the highest standard at all, all times. He asked slaves to think of the fact that they were serving Christ in whatever they did. Summarizing Paul's approach to slaves, notice these particular points from the Bible study guide. Jim? Their slave masters are diminished by Paul as their earthly masters, pointing toward the real and heavenly Father, Ephesians 6. Heavenly Master. Heavenly Master, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I saw. Okay. Uh, so if you're all, all slaves of the same master, then what position does that give you over anybody else? Okay, go ahead. They're, excuse me, they are to serve with fear and trembling with a sincere heart as you would Christ, Ephesians 6, 5. Okay. Paul notes the substitution most clearly in arguing that Christian slaves are to offer genuine service as slaves, not of their masters, but as slaves of Christ. Well, they, how do you put uh, John uh, 15, 15, I call you friends rather yeah. than slaves. And friends is a horizontal relationship. There's yeah. no hierarchy listed in yeah. that thing. So anyway, <coughs> in performing their service, they are to do the will of God from the heart, offering heartfelt service directed to God, Ephesians 6, 6. Paul invites positively motivated service, offered as to the Lord and not to man, Ephesians 6, verse 7, from the Bible, also from okay. the Bible study guide. If you were a slave, suppose you knew that you were a slave directly to Jesus Christ, and you knew what he plans to do for you, would you serve him willingly? Well, basically, uh, you know, if, 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 was it uh, Mark 12, verses uh, 28 and 29, and they asked the man, so what is the most important, uh, what is the first yeah. commandment? Yeah. To listen. Mm hmm Well, Paul assures, assured Christian slaves that they will be treated fairly in the end by Christ and will receive a reward to, for whatever they have done. Why do you suppose Christ, Scripture does not blatantly and outrightly condemn slavery? In Paul's day, slavery was so widely practiced that trying to condemn it would have immediately placed him in opposition to the Roman government and would have prevented him from proceeding with this Christian work. They would list that it all is misinformation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Paul also had some very clear commands, comments, I'm sorry, for Christian masters. Gary? Second Corinthians 5.10 for all of us must appear before Christ to be judged by him. We will each receive what we deserve according to everything we have done, good or bad, in our bodily life. And that's from the Good News Bible. Colossians 3, 24 to 25. Remember that the Lord will give you as a reward what he has kept for his people. 
for Christ is the real master you serve. And wrongdoers will be repaid for the wrong things they do because God judges everyone by the same standard from the Good News Bible. Okay, Gordon, you want to pick it up there? From the Bible Study Guide. Assuming that you are a Christian slave master who is listening to Ephesians being read out in your house church, how might you react to this counsel offered in the presence of your slaves? Yeah, <laughs> imagine that. Wow. And then Ephesians 6, 9 is where it was. Masters behave in the same way towards your slaves and stop using threats. Remember that you and your slaves belong to the same master in heaven who judges everyone by the same standard. Good News Bible. We would hope that Christian slave masters would treat their slaves as Christ would treat them if he were their earthly master. Paul forbade what were then but common we practices. We know how Christ would treat them. I mean, we can extrapolate from how he treated people, but yeah. we don't know specifically what he would do. What he would do as a slave master? Yeah. Uh, well, do, you know, the saying, do what... I no longer call you slaves. Do what... Uh, what would Jesus do is the saying. Yeah. What would Jesus do? Well, that's imposing my thoughts yeah. on someone else. Mm -hmm. It might be correct, but it might not. Well, Paul forbade, um, forbade what were then common practices used with slavery, such as beatings, sexual abuse, being sold and thus being separated from loved ones, extreme labor as a punishment, starvation, shackles, branding, even death. From the Bible Study Guide for September, for Thursday, September 7. He reminded masters that they would be judged by God for all of those things they did to their slaves. Each of us will stand before the judgment seat of God. Jennifer, I think that's yours. First Peter 2.20 For what credit is there if you endure the beatings you deserve for having done wrong? But if you endure suffering even when you have done right, God will bless you for it. From the Good News Bible. Wow. After having listened to Paul's counsel to their masters, do you suppose the slaves that responded by ill treatment, responded to ill treatment by saying, just wait until you're judged by God for your behavior? <laughs> Would you think any of the slaves dared to say that to their masters? I wonder what happened. Well, there's an interesting story about the Philemon and Onesimus story. We don't know this for sure, but we do know that ma many years, quite a few years, 40, 50 years later, after the Onesimus and Philemon story took place, the head of the church at Ephesus received a letter from one of the other church leaders, and it was addressed to Onesimus, the head of the church at Ephesus. Mm. So it's possible that that slave ended up being the chief Christian in the Ephesian church. And would that be why the book is in the Bible to uh, kind of give his story? Very likely, yeah. After having listened to Paul's counsel to their masters, do you suppose I've already read that? Paul gave, us, gave a very interesting logical summary of how Christian slaves should be treated in the small book of Philemon, which we've talked about. Notice these summary words from Philemon 15 and 16. It may be that Onesimus was away from you for a short time so that you might have him back for all time. And now he is not just a slave, but much more than a slave. He is a dear brother in Christ. How much he means to me and how much more he will mean to you, both as a slave and as a, slave and as a brother in the Lord. So what promises did Paul actually give to slaves? Well... From the Bible Study Guide, much of Paul's language in Ephesians would be especially heartening for Christian slaves. Adoption as sons, Ephesians, what is that, 1.5. Redemption, Ephesians 1.7. Inheritance, Ephesians 1.11 and 14. Ephesians 3.6. Being enthroned with Jesus, Ephesians 2.6. Becoming fellow Christ citizens, that is, members of the house hold of God, Ephesians 2.19, compare Ephesians 3.14 and 15, and integral parts of the body of Christ, Ephesians 3.6 
in Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. Ephesians 6, 5 to 9 activates all the teaching in the letter as operative in the relationship between slaves and slave masters, including the counsel which, excuse me, the counsel about speech, Ephesians 4. No, counsels. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Including the counsel about speech, Ephesians 4, 25 to 32, and sexual ethics, Ephesians 5, 1 to 14. This is also from the Bible. Okay. Guide. Many of you can remember the days when Dr. Graham Maxwell used to talk about David and Bathsheba and Solomon standing and up walks Uriah the Hittite. And he's saying hi to his wife. And she says, well, our, uh, he says, who's this fine young man standing next to you, Solomon? Well, we didn't have any children. Where did he come from? You know, <laughs> and how many slave stories like that are going to take place when we get to heaven? Oh, you were the, you were the master. I was a slave. Hmm. And now you're here. Hmm. Mm -hmm. How will that relationship change? One thing I think everybody will know that everybody is teachable. They have, and they, can have be still, they still have the capacity to learn and they're willing to, uh, willing to listen. Considering what we have studied so far in this lesson, what changes need to be made among church members today in our relationships, especially to children? Have we as individuals carefully followed biblical advice in dealing with our children? Consider the following question from the Bible study guide. Gary? What does it mean for Adventists that love for children is identified as evidence of a people prepared for the Lord? Luke 1, 17. Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to quote that for you. I'm going to go all the way back to Malachi 4, 6. Look at what this says. He will bring fathers and children together again. Otherwise, I would have to come and destroy your country. This is talking about the prophet Elijah and his final end time message. They thought Elijah was going to come up um, and reappear as an actual individual. No, this is talking about, um, you know, a group of people or an individual person at the end of time going to prepare people for the second coming of Christ by bringing families and, and church members together with all these kinds of advices that we're reading about. Okay, go ahead. Paul's obvious respect for children su suggests rather a searching question. What is our responsibility to extend the care of Christ to children who have experienced violence, sexual abuse, and shame in their early lives? In view of research on the profound impact of adverse Children, childhood rather, experiences, or in bracket, aces. So, what's and there's a, a reference there. If you, get, if you get the handout, which is available, these handouts are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, and you can look all this information up. Adverse childhood experiences are common. <clears throat> Jennifer, do you want to make a comment? Yes, that is true. <laughs> what about all these people that are coming across the border? Yeah. And, and where are they disappearing to with these little kids unattended? Yeah. About 64% of U.S. adults reported they have experienced at least one type of adverse childhood event before the age of 18. And nearly one in six, that is 17.3%, reported they had experienced four or more types of adverse childhood events. That's from the CDC website, okay? That's, that's, we're not talking about any church group or any particular disadvantaged group. We're talking about a national organization reporting, right? Okay, uh, Gordon? Continuing from the Bible study guide, as an extension of Paul's respect for children and Jesus' care for them, what responsibilities does the church have to nurture and protect the children in its care? What systems and procedures need to be in place to do so? So this okay, is continuing so, the questions from the Bible study guide. Uh, there's a story I'd like to interrupt for a second 
about the pastor who went off and he said, I'm going to be gone for two or three weeks. He conducted an evangelistic series. He came back and says, well, I baptized three and a half, children, three and a half people. And his wife said, what? You mean three adults and one child? He said, no, I baptized three children and one adult. The, children, the adult's life is already half gone. I only got half of him. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Oh, Paul's counsel to slaves and slave masters uh, in Ephesians 6, 5 to 9 is often applied to the relationships between employees and employers. In what ways might this be appropriate? What dangers present themselves in doing so? Yeah. Yeah. If you're employed, do you think of yourself as a slave? Not usually, but... Uh, <laughs> slave, next point. Slavery remains a painful reality in our world, with more than 40 million people enslaved, according to the Global Slavery Index. Global Slavery Index. As free people whose spiritual forebearers were firmly committed to the abolition of slavery, what are our responsibilities to these enslaved sons and daughters of God as we sing of Christ, quote, chains shall he break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppression shall cease. And those are lyrics from O Holy Night. Okay. So, Jennifer? Luke 1, verse 17. He will go ahead of the Lord, strong and mighty like the prophet Elijah. He will bring fathers and children together again. He will turn disobedient people back to the way of thinking of the righteous. He will get the Lord's people ready for him from the Good News Bible. Now I'm going to I'm going to ask you to think about this for a little bit. Jennifer has just read in Luke 117. I read from Malachi 4 6 and those passages I mean Luke was quoting from Malachi what is going to be the final message of Elijah and who's going to be carrying it? Do we know? Will we? Okay. Ellen White makes it pretty clear that this is a message that's supposed to be carried by God's final end time people. And who does that include? Let's all look at each other, shall we? <laughs> yeah. Because everyone from the disciples onward have thought it was, yep. they were the last generation. Would it be correct to summarize what we have studied by saying that we should treat all people, even those from different generations and from different social classes, as Christ would treat them? How do we know how Christ would treat them? How do we know what Jesus would do? It should be very clear that Paul did not approve of slavery in spite of the fact that some critics claim he did. Do you see a significant difference between the way parents should relate to children and the way employers should relate to employees? What would be those differences and why? Okay, don't everyone speak at once. <laughs> I, I don't think there's a lot of differences. I think the focus has to be on the relationship Mm -hmm. rather than on behavioral management or, um, you know, setting expectations and having consequences. I think it has to be about that relationship and problem solving. Okay. So, and basically, every Christian, theoretically, should treat those that he associates with, especially those that he has, you know, regular interactions with, as if they were children of God and hopefully drawing them into the kingdom of God. How did Jesus treat the, his enemies at the, at the, yeah. in John, what, John 16, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19? Mm -hmm. you look at it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's uh, he talked, uh, by the end, your conclusion, you don't need to fear death. You don't need to uh, criticize or use foul language against uh, your enemies. You yeah. don't, uh, you just, uh, yeah. He, he, he taught, it was the ultimate teaching aid. He did call them, you whitewashed... Sepulchers. Sepulchers, which yeah. wasn't a complimentary term. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> you have to communicate it, I, at some I think, level. I think that was even the Sanhedrin that he called that, wasn't yes. it? Yes. First of all, children are given to us as a gift from the Lord and are meant to be educated and trained according to God's principles. We do not have the same responsibility for employees. So there is that 
difference. Children should be brought up learning to do household chores according to their abilities at whatever age. Chores should not be thought of as punishments, but rather as education. Our lesson suggests that the story of Joseph in Egypt under Potiphar is a good example of how employees should relate to their employers. Does that seem fair to you? Is it wise counsel? Well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has some very clear advice about children and their families. In our fundamental belief number 23, we are told, God blesses the family and intends that its members shall assist each other towards, toward complete maturity, increasing family closeness as one of the earmarks of the final group, um, I'm sorry, the final gospel message. Parents are to bring up their children to love and obey the Lord. By their example and their words, they are to teach them that, that Christ is a loving, tender, and caring guide who wants them to become members of his body, the family of God, which embraces both single and married persons. Wow. From our Bible study guide, we're quoting from the, uh, the advice from the General Conference, but quoted in our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 147. From observing, observing what happens in our society, it is clear that harsh treatment of children and youth often leads to very dysfunctional behavior later in life. Again, I'm going to turn to you, Jennifer. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Okay, Jim? I contrast examples from Scripture as well as large body of research confirm the effectiveness of more gentle forms of discipline that allow children to learn through re reasoning and experience the consequences of their choices. Such milder measures have been demonstrated to increase the likelihood children will make life-affirming choices and espouse parental values as they mature. This statement invites the churches to become a, quote, safe place for children, providing emotional and spiritual healing for the affected children, the Executive Committee of the General Conference. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Similar statements, including practical recommendations, have issued in 1997, child sexual abuse voted by the spring meeting of the General Conference Executive Committee. Down here at Loma Linda. Now, when, when sin arose in heaven, uh, how much of a, an authoritarian was, was the creator? <laughs> and and yeah. when you use the term, uh, a, uh, an emergency rose in God's family. That was not an emergency if, if the infinite has foreknowledge. Mm -hmm. which I believe infinite does have foreknowledge. So it, but he knew what it takes to have love. You have to have freedom, otherwise mm -hmm. you'll never have love. It was an emergency not in the eyes of God, but it was an emergency probably in the eyes of the angels. Oh, I'm not, I'm not in disagreement with that, of course. But uh, education is the only way to make things. And then that process brings about persuasion, not faith. Faith is not a good term many times because it, it gives, many times they use it, well, faith is believing something you know ain't true. Yeah, well, misusing a word doesn't make it a good word. I understand. I well, Adventists hopefully do not need or have a specific passage about slavery, hopefully. Notice these words from Fundamental Belief number 14. Carrie? Unity in the body of Christ proclaims that, quote, in Christ we have a new creation, distinctions of race, culture, learning, and nationality, and differences between high and low, rich and poor, male and female, must not be divisive, rather, among us. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Here's a question that I have struggled with in my mind. And I want you to think about it. Maybe has, someone has a magic answer. We're going to be living in heaven, hopefully, with people from all generations, all cultures, both sexes, uh, all ages in their development. All these people are going to come together. As we relate to everybody, 
are we all going to all of a sudden speak the same language? Or are we going to learn how to communicate in different languages? Well, what, what happened to the disciples? Well, they, they could suddenly learn or speak fluently mm -hmm. and adeptly mm -hmm. in every language that they came to. Yep, yep. So I, okay. I suspect we'll have the same gift. So we'll be able to, you know, if we can say it better in this language, we'll use that language. We can say it better in this language, we'll use that language. And how will we relate to... It's still, a, time is part of the equation. It, yeah. it, it, there's no quick fix. Because if, if, if it were, then why didn't you say, well, why didn't God do it at the beginning? No, you have to have freedom to make, freedom to reject evil and choose the good. Yeah. Okay. That's time. Go ahead. We are all equal. We are all equal in Christ, who by one spirit has bonded us into one fellowship with him and with one another. We are to serve and be served without partiality or reservation. And in brackets, available from... The uh, website. Yeah, there it is. Go ahead. Even if the church had not voted on a statement specifically addressing slavery, related statements on poverty and human relations have been adopted, such as homelessness and poverty, General Conference President Neil Wilson, yeah. 1990, released at the General Conference session in Indianapolis, Indiana. If you have any kinds of questions about these materials, it's very useful to look up our website, download this Sabbath School study guide, and you'll have access to all these materials and really know what our church teaches on these subjects. Well, have you had experiences with unfair treatment when you were a child, or perhaps have you been tempted to mistreat your own children? Notice these thoughts, thoughtful questions or thought questions, and I'm not going to have a chance to read all of them. Perhaps you've been mistreated or mis maltreated by your parents in the past. Even so, what are three principles in Ephesians 5 and 6 that you could serve as a guide? And we need to con conclude there. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for this guidance from Paul and really ultimately from yourself through Paul in how to relate to other beings and how we need to know how to best relate to them because someday we if the right things happen, we'll be living together forever is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.